Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Well, I've been cleaning up my office <laughs> and came across a paper I wrote in February 1969. It would mean shortly after Merton's death. And it's, um, I thought it, when I read it, it hadn't been published, but it has been. It was in a collection edited by Patrick Hart, Brother Patrick. Some reminiscences of Thomas Merton. These comments are personal reflections of a monk on a monk who lived among us and does so no longer, only in spirit. More about what kind of man he was to live with, how we saw him, more than a study of any ambitious length. Even at that, there were but one man's view. And that monk in the Abbey only nine years with Father Lewis. But I did have him as novice master, worked with him, knew him fairly well, and thought of him as I still do as a friend. Further, it is only with some fear that I put these thoughts down, for he was deep, complex, very holy man, many-sided. Besides, it's too soon, hardly cold in his grave. But taken for what they are, these amusings of a man lately among us and may be of interest. You could tell him by his walk. <clears throat> he had a rather rapid walk, not altogether measured and orderly. For one thing, his feet were spread out fan fashion, and there was something sad in his gait. Vigorous walk, except when he was reading, which he often did. Small hands and feet. He was hard on shoes. Had a fine torso with strong shoulders and back. His legs seemed somewhat short, and they made him look smaller than he was. Clothes didn't suit him well. He never looked neat and spruce, though in his monk's habit he was presentable enough. Things hung on him, looked baggy and shapeless. Even when dressed in civilian clothes, he didn't look sharp. He looked a bit disordered and disorganized. Didn't care much about clothes. That was obvious. In the years he's living in his hermitage, he would appear at the monastery for dinner as for some appointments in some odd combination of, all, of work clothes, Gem generally with a nut to shake case for his mail or books and a bag of groceries to take back to the hill. If you stopped to talk to him for a moment, he was glad enough to do so. Wake, interested, looked at you closely with bright eyes. He had a rather plain face, but his eyes were full of life and full of merriment. His voice was quiet, his laugh was gentle and deep, like a chuckle. He had a way of sensing when something was over and he would end the matter there. This was a real characteristic of him. He loathed dragging things out beyond their measure. When something was finished, he was ready for the next assignment. When I was a novice, I recalled that in periods of spiritual direction, he always seemed to know before I did when the matter was over. It always seemed to me an ending rather abrupt, but when I thought on it later, it was simply that he grasped quickly that the situation had reached a point of terminus. In meetings of the abbot's council or the building committee, or any such group, he was often ill at ease because they weren't sometimes dragged on, you know, windy and long drawn out discussions which bored him and exasperated him. Windy drawn out discussions were not his thing. If there was no more to be said, he was off. Visitors and callers who had nothing more than small talk got short shrift from him. But he was always courteous and kind to anyone who had a need. 
He wasn't hasty or restless, but he knew how to get off the phone. Hated to waste time. <clears throat> Had great reverence for time. Sort of a sacrament for him. Always totally immersed in what he did. He never played at anything. In his work, he was systematic, followed regular procedures. He had his work well, organi well organized, as we say. I recall again from my novitiate days that he would assign our work in the morning after chapter and then go upstairs to his office and his writing. Once in a while, there'd be some question would come up about the work before we got started. So somebody had to go up and ask him. And he was generally very short and even curt. He did not like being bothered once he was into his work. And he didn't mind insisting that such courtesy toward others, leaving him in peace and undisturbed, was a normal thing for a good monk. You didn't do that to people. I often helped him, typing manuscripts or answering mail. It's a difficult job. He couldn't read his writing. And you didn't like to bother him, because you knew if he did, he wouldn't like it either. And in his manuscripts, he was very consistent. He typed the first draft, <clears throat> then he would go over it by hand <clears throat> in blue ink, blue pen, making corrections. Then he would go over it again the third time with a black pen, make more corrections or additions. Then have someone type it on a stencil usually a novice. Then he'd mail that to his friends, and then he'd get feedback on that. Then he would rewrite the whole thing and then submit it to a magazine. Then it would be published and more feedback. Then that would be corrected and refined, and then finally it would show up with a bunch of others in a book. It became a kind of pattern he had. He had a sense of being aware that he was somewhat isolated, and he didn't want to make some obvious blunder. The vast amount of material has never been published. We still have it. They're working on it. He had system. He had plans on what he did and what time, what things he would do during the day, what type of reading he would do and when. He liked to save steps and time on his way to church to choir He'd mail his letters, or check the bulletin board, or pick up a pair of shoestrings, or get some razor blades. But he did it easily, without tension. He was good at keeping appointments. He had an air of dispatch in what he did. Generally was thorough, but sometimes he was rather hasty. Had fine insights into people. Good judge of character. Sometimes blundered in his interviews with postulants, but overall his perception was above average. And he could be open to discussion, see your view too. But once he had his mind made up, he was hard to change. He was tender hearted, really, and quite gentle. And sometimes he found some of his duties difficult, and he'd avoid them if he could get away with it honorably. But he was no coward, and he could be quite straightforward and uncom uncompromising, and could wither you with his directness. With the novices, too, he wasn't all unwilling to see what they were made of. More than once, I found out that he had a way of testing the spirit, even though I was a mature priest. I was 45 when I entered. He wasn't shy with his comments. I remember one time in the sacristy before Mass, I was feeling kind of low, and I must have had on a sour puss. And he came up to me and he said, this is days of silence, of course, come up to me and he said, cheer up, Matt. And of course, he wasn't making a greeting. He was telling me, you have no right to go around with a face like that. <laughs> <laughs> When you consider the amount of writing he did in his lifetime, the uh, output staggers you. And it was only part of his work because he had a, a, a lot of, he did a lot of reading, spiritual reading, and then reading in connection with his writing. 
and then he had his regular monastic choir duties, and besides, he was novice master for the last 10 years. And he wrote for the novices a whole set of notes and conferences on the rule, monastic fathers, history of the order, monastic spirituality, most of it mimeograph. We still have all that. <coughs> hasn't, been hasn't been touched yet. His health wasn't the best beside all that. And he never had a secretary until just before he left for Bangkok. So he was really a workhorse, meaning he made good use of his time. Even in the old days when the routine called for a nap at noon, after noon meal, he was loath to sleep in the daytime. P couldn't probably, any, probably couldn't anyway. The most popular of his, one of the most popular of his poems, the, on the death of his brother, who died in the war. He told me, he wrote it as he lay in bed during the siesta. When he got up, he typed it out. But work time was work time with him, and when it was done, it was done. He was merciless to the novices when he found them stretching their work beyond his prescribed hours, particularly if there was no need. He didn't approve of great projects that ate up your reading time. One of them being a horror of extravagant decorations for Christmas or for Corpus Christi. In the old days, they were really quite elaborate. Now they're rather modest. He loved the hours of the night for prayer, and in the hermitage spent the night hours in prayer, saving his office and mass for daytime. He took a dim view of monks who couldn't get to bed on time, or for that matter, get up on time. He himself was very regular. He couldn't sleep in the dormitory because so many monks snored, kept him awake. So they let him have a, a cell at the top of the stairwell, you know, up, you know, where the stairs go up, there was an opening. They built a little room for him up there, which was fine, except, of course, he'd hear you coming in at night if you were late. And that would bother him, and he'd let you know about it. <laughs> the farm brothers used to like to work by moonlight, you know, bringing in the soybeans or the alfalfa. Of course, you could hear the machinery at night. He let them know about it. He didn't, didn't like that. But he didn't go around, you know, correcting everybody, you know. Wasn't that kind of a man. He was a phenomenal worker. I think he worked harder than anybody else in the monastery, although he didn't look it. He used to get an interest in a certain subject. He'd send her a note to the library at the university in Lexington or to the university, or to the Lexington Library, and ask for the books on the subject. Then they'd ship him a batch of books. Then he'd read all that stuff. Then he'd do articles on that, and eventually show up in a book. You know. He was very interested in community life. He wasn't a gossip or a busybody, but he knew what was going on. He didn't miss much. His comments were often precise and witty. And even as a hermit, he stayed in touch. You know, he loved people, but he loved nature too. Nature played a large role in his life. Fond of the woods, and early in his monastic life, found time to get there. He could identify all the trees and many kinds of wildlife. And the novices under, and the scholastics, that is the young monks under his care, planted thousands of seedlings and young trees in washed out areas. Through his instigation, the Forest Service built a fire tower on top of the, one of the knobs, and he had dreams of being a hermit during the fire season, living in a little cabin underneath the fire tower. Then to expedite his getting back and forth, they bought him a yellow Jeep, egg yellow. But he couldn't drive, he almost <laughs> almost killed himself. And so the seller had told him, don't ever get in that Jeep again. <laughs> that was the end of that project. He became the novice master at the same time. 